7 p.m., March 8, 1987. Ray and Rita DeMell drive home after drinks at the local VFW. A few miles into the trip, Ray pulls their van into a turnout near Blanco Bridge and promptly passes out. Unable to wake her husband, Rita becomes concerned and flags down a passing motorist. The Good Samaritan pulls into the turnout driving a dark-colored pickup and parks within a few feet of Ray DeMell's bumper. Less than an hour after that, dispatch takes in a 911 call. Dana Peterson arrives at the turnout to discover Rita DeMell, hysterical along the side of the road. And her 49-year-old husband, Ray, dead. Mr. DeMell was in the vehicle. He was in the driver's side. Uh, the side window of the driver's door uh, is uh, broken. I recall one bullet hole through the roof, and uh, the other bullet had entered Mr. DeMell from the uh, left side. The shooter, according to Mrs. DeMell, was the man who stopped to offer roadside assistance. He may have been able to wake Mr. DeMell up because the, vehicle, the van rolls and contacts the suspect vehicle. The suspect gets real mad, according to Mrs. DeMell, and, and starts shouting, no mother can run into my van, or something along that line. A good Samaritan no more, the pickup owner grabbed a gun from his truck and fired two shots at close range into the DeMell van. Assessing the scene, Peterson speculates the first shot was fired accidentally as the assailant broke DeMell's driver's side window with the butt of his gun. Yeah, I think he would have just hit it and broken it this way, and that first round, as his hand passed through, it pre-shattered it, it put the first round up through the top of the roof, and then he just continued down. Mr. DeMell is probably leaning away when he was shot, and that's why he was in that position. Evidence at the scene supports Peterson's theory. Two 45 caliber shell casings are found inside DeMell's van, consistent with an attack at close range. Tire tracks appear to show a second truck pulling quite close to where DeMell's van was parked, again, consistent with Rita DeMell's story. Finally, an officer picks up a small address book dropped in the dust close to where the shooting occurred. Detectives wonder if the killer didn't perhaps drop the book as he fled the scene. Sometimes uh, bad guys uh, make uh, silly mistakes and, and that's all to our benefit, you know. So we, when we found the address book, we figured, well, this, is, this has got to take us someplace. But we just basically started calling the people in the notebook, telling them we found this notebook, basically we're trying to identify who owns it. The address book appears to belong to a 27-year-old local named Norman Baird. According to friends, Baird also owns a dark gray pickup. Detectives approach him at home and ask whether he might be missing an address book. We just made a casual contact with him, non-accusatory, uh, saying we just been, we found this laying out in this area and uh, it's do you recognize this book as yours? And he was able to identify it as his. We told him that we were involved in an investigation and we needed to ask him some questions on uh, his uh, whereabouts uh, the day before. And, and he indicated he'd not been out of town, that he'd not gone out by the Blanco Bridge, which is where the crime scene was. But he couldn't explain how his notebook had gotten to the crime scene. Detectives are not necessarily buying Norman Baird's story, but have no probable cause to search his home or truck. They return to the names in the address book, hoping to get a handle on whether Baird is telling them the truth. One of the first people they want to speak with, Norman Baird's oldest friend, a man we will call Ron. Ron tells police he saw Baird on the day Ray DeMell was killed. The two attended a party in Salinas. Ron says Baird left the party around 6 p.m. for a job interview in nearby Marina. Contrary to Baird's statement, that would have taken him down Blanco Road at about the time Rita DeMell was looking for help. 
that was just another confirmation that Baird was not being truthful. And the more inconsistencies and the more lies you can uh, catch a suspect in, uh, the better for the investigation. For investigators, it's all starting to make sense. A man with perhaps a few beers under his belt gets into a roadside beef, pulls out a gun and fires. Then, in his haste to leave the scene, leaves everything but his business card for police to find. Detectives file for a search warrant, hoping a look inside Baird's home and truck will move their case from theory to fact. Detectives want to question Baird further about his whereabouts on the night of the shooting and how his address book got so close to a murder. The suspect, however, lawyers up and refuses to talk. Investigators cannot get a murder charge approved against Baird, and the case goes cold. A little something more would not surface for more than a decade. In January of 2002, Bella Santos knocks on Ron's front door. And he answered the door. I told him who I was and what I'm investigating and told him that I needed him to come down to the office, and he agreed to do it. I know you didn't shoot the guy. Okay, so you're not the murderer. You're not the guy I'm looking for. Okay? And so today, I just want a truthful statement from you as to what Norman told you. According to Ron, Baird brought the gun with him into Ron's home. Not knowing what else to do, Ron took the gun from his friend. In a situation like that, where do you want the gun? Your hands or his? His hands, the whole public's in trouble, maybe. My hands, he can't get it back. Let me ask you, did you destroy the gun? No. Did, did Norman give you the gun to get rid of it for him? If I was to answer that, it would incriminate me, wouldn't it? He had started to, to waver by saying, you know, what, if I say something, is it going to incriminate me? And, and I kept assuring him that he was helping me in this investigation. So as, as he spoke to me, I could tell that he wanted to tell me something, and, and he knew where the gun was. De Los Santos is a statement away from getting a fix on his murder weapon. The detective doesn't push, letting Ron find his way to the truth. Well, you got an address I can go get the gun at? No, sir. I'll just drive over there and pick it up. It's, it's, it's not at an address. Is it buried somewhere? Yes, sir. But I wanted to get rid of that gun. I didn't want it around where he could come back and get it. So I disposed of it. I buried it in the side of a mountain. Okay, is it Old Stage Road or San Juan Road, San Juan Grade Road? I guess it'd be Old Stage. Okay. Can you point it out to me? I, I hope so. Norman Baird's best friend tells cold case detectives he put Baird's gun in a military-style ammo box and buried it in a field next to a tree. Problem is, the field is nearly an acre big and contains close to 100 trees. I thought, we're never going to find it. This was just something, another thing that's going to end up being a dead end. Hoping to shorten his odds, De Los Santos calls upon a group expert in finding lost things also known as the Treasure Hunters Society of Santa Clara Valley. Less than an hour into the effort, Warren Whited works an area near a large oak tree, locks on to a solid signal, and begins to dig. Took out the scraper and scraped away about maybe three or four inches of leaves, and then start bringing down maybe three to four inches of dirt, and I could make out the outline of a ammunition box. And so I gave a good holler, got a target over here, and. The lead man got hold of the officer and up they came. Detective Delos Santos IDs the ammo box as the one Ron buried more than a decade earlier. Inside it is a 45 caliber gun and cartons of ammunition. Latent prints lifted off the cartons are matched to Norman Baird. Ballistics tests confirm the buried 45 was the weapon used to kill Ray Demel. Gold case detectives have all the hard evidence they need. Fifteen years after the fact, Baird is charged with second-degree murder, pleads no contest, and is sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. 